Today we're going over a famous and fascinating paper from David Jacobs and Claire Michaels, who proposed that learning is direct. There are three really important things I want to highlight in this paper. First, they give a definition of direct perception that is extremely reasonable. That perception can be portrayed as a single valued function of a single ambient energy pattern. What does that mean? Well, consider the variable tau, which is the ratio of optical size to the rate of optical expansion that under many conditions specifies the time to collision between you and any object. So if you were to say, Bren, I'm sick of all this science. Won't you just get to the point and you throw a book right at my head? My perception of the time to head to book contact could be portrayed as a function of tau with one value. That does not mean that we could not theoretically decompose the mechanisms of detecting tau into different neural or sensory mechanisms. It simply means that we can assume perception can be represented at this level of coarseness, and that portraying perception at this level might be far more useful than others. This brings us to the second important point. If perception is a single valued function of a single ambient energy pattern, then skilled perception might change two main areas. Which informational variable is going into that function and the function itself? You might throw that book at me and perhaps as a baby, I might have tried to perceive time to collision based on the color of the book and gotten hit in the face. But after a while, I might realize that tau does a great job of telling me when I have to duck. So I start using tau as an input. But even using tau, I might still get it wrong. So I would need to calibrate that function to get the correct time to collision. They suggest perceptual learning is due to three things which are deeply coupled. Attention changes what variables can go into that function. If I'm not looking at the book, I can't perceive tau. Similarly, if I intend to read the cover, I probably won't try to perceive time to collision at all. They define the education of intentions as improving which of the possible perceptions and actions animals intend to actualize. Finally, calibration would be refinement of the function itself. Now, for the most interesting part, we're going to have to get a little crazy. They did an experiment where they showed people videos of two balls colliding and asked them to estimate the relative mass of each ball with feedback on accuracy. They hypothesized that the input to the perception function could be represented as a linear combination of three variables. The difference in scatter angle, the difference in exit speed, and a mass specifying invariant. That mass specifying invariant is the perfect variable that would perfectly correlate to the mass ratio. The other two would only partially correlate. They took one group and showed them collisions where the scatter angle difference had zero correlation with the mass ratio and showed another group collisions where the exit speed difference had no correlation. They found that participants in both groups started to pay more attention to the mass specifying invariant over multiple trials. The participants whose collisions showed exit speed difference had no correlation to the mass ratios quickly stopped paying attention to it, while they kept paying attention to it in the group where it had a high correlation. They created an information space to represent all combinations of weights with which people might pay attention to those kinematic variables. A higher order variable composed of a combination of lower order variables. Assuming a linear combination of those three, they could plot it on a two dimensional space. They could then look at the correlation of this higher order variable with the actual mass ratio and create a vector field that moves the composition around based on accuracy. Zero correlation, change it a lot. High correlation, change it a little. Perfect correlation, leave it as is. This vector field would quickly converge on the perfect information for this task. The crazy part is that the vector field, which represents perceptual learning, depends on the correlations between variables, which depends on the collisions they saw. They showed that real participants moved through that information space similarly to simulated participants moving based on the vector field. This is just one of many studies showing perceptual learning is a big part of motor learning. Now, this is a simplified model of perception that isn't fully consistent with affordances, a core concept of ecological psychology. Fage in 2007 showed a similar model of information-based control of braking couldn't account for actual braking behavior, but an affordance-based model that takes action capability into account did it better. Affordances are opportunities for action that emerge from our relationship with the environment. 
So in this experiment, people were asked to perceive mass ratio of the colliding balls where their perceiving function receives a higher order variable that is a combination of scatter angle difference, exit speed difference, and a mass specifying invariant. Imagine a much higher order informational variable that contains a complex combination of all sorts of other movement information, including information about you that might be relevant towards whether or not you could pick up the balls and throw them. Then the vector field would move us through a much higher dimensional information space with repeated trials converging again upon information that, with the right function, could tell us with perfect accuracy whether or not we could pick up the ball. That's why we don't struggle to pick up everyday objects and why we don't have to perform complex mental calculations to pick up a glass of water. This is how we think the vast majority of perception actually works. And in ecological dynamics, movement is an online dance between perceiving, acting, and cognizing that is fundamentally inseparable. For movers and movement teachers of all disciplines, this suggests we should look closely at the training environment that we create. All we have to do for learning is create environments rich with the movement information we want students to attune to, while they search with focus and intention of creating successful outcomes. You don't need to point them to the exact perfect technique. Put them in an environment where they search that information space productively, and the vector field will drive them where they need to be. And by the way, even if you knew the perfect technique passed down from God himself, your students would learn the function of that technique faster with constraints rather than prescriptive instruction. Let's use an example. Say you want people to learn a double leg takedown. You could show them all the details, but the longer the explanation, the more time you're spending trying to describe a specific place in the information space without having students actually working within it. Having them practice on a non-resistant partner isn't giving them the rich multimodal information they need. Instead, give them a task. For instance, start from a distance and connect your chest to your partner's hips without letting them connect to yours. This points their attention and intention in the right direction. And by playing the game, they get immersed in the rich multimodal movement information needed for successful takedowns against resistance. Once they become skilled at this, have them work to finish the full takedown with submissions live. Spend 10 hours playing those games and variations of them, and voila, you have athletes skilled in doing and defending the most common takedowns in wrestling. In movement, coaches often isolate movements from their context for repetitive drills. Unless your target sport is having students attuned to your verbal feedback and perform movements that look like you want them to, you're better off not doing that. Remember, you can't learn to swim if you don't want to get wet. Instructors often aim to teach functional movements while removing athletes from the water that is their functional orientation and dynamic environment. It doesn't matter how quickly or how many times you punch and kick pieces of paper. You aren't attuning to information about whether you could punch another person or how to defend against those punches. Stop removing students from their performance environment. Focus on the function of movements and create training environments that force students to learn by modifying constraints of the task, environment, and performer, and you'll have much better results. Finally, it hasn't escaped me that this video doesn't touch at all on how movement is actually coordinated. This video is properly a companion to my documentary about ecological dynamics, which will soon be posted to this YouTube channel. And if this video does well, I might do another one about movement coordination and ecological dynamics. Let me know your thoughts in the comments below. I'm interested to hear what you guys think.